this hearing of the Senate Tax Committee, Tuesday, March 7th. The first order of business is adoption of the minutes from um, March 2nd, 2023. Um, please look over the minutes. Are there any corrections? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved as presented. The first bill on our agenda this morning is Senate File uh, 1063, Senator Westrom. Please, uh, uh, you're welcome to the um, committee to present um, your bill um, along with your testifier. Senator Westrom. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. Uh, the Senate file uh, talks, uh, addresses the need for speed the high-speed internet uh, rural broadband bill uh, in some cases, um, but ultimately a bigger picture of getting border-to-border uh, -border high speed internet uh, deployed. Uh, Minnesota has uh, the border-to-border -border program that uh, does one-time investments in the hard-to-serve areas that uh, have under, uh, do not have uh, high-speed internet, uh, the unserved or the underserved. Uh, Internet, and in 2017, um, many of many of us uh, thought we had covered this with the sales tax exemption uh, that was passed in the tax bill, uh, but it turns out that only is being interpreted to apply to landlines, uh, services, or television services, and not the broadband internet uh, service. So uh, fiber deployed for. Uh, high-speed internet is still paying the sales tax, and so uh, this bill would, uh, in essence, clean up what many of us thought was happening in 2017. Uh, but it would also be helpful in continuing the rural broadband or the border-to-border -border program. It's not all rural. It is pockets in the metro areas that, especially if they've grown in the last 10, 10 uh, 15 years, that find themselves in a township that maybe doesn't have high-speed internet as well. And so uh, this bill would make sense uh, to exempt the sales tax like we thought we did. Uh, retroactively, it, it uh, applies to uh, that sales tax that's been paid for the, the broadband that's been deployed. And lastly, Madam Chair, we've uh, seen a lot of federal money and uh, some state money that has gone into finishing this project. Uh, it'd be nice to uh, uh, see the Office of Broadband have its, have its mission accomplished. Uh, many of us have talked about uh, the measurement of success in this program is when the Office of Broadband is no longer needed uh, to finish the rural border-to-border -border program. And uh, that is actually in the foreseeable future with what we passed last year through the legislature. Uh, another uh, solid investment proposed this year, uh, quite a bit of federal money that's coming into our state over the next four or five years. And so it would be very timely to pass this bill. And Madam uh, Chair, uh, in the interest of need for speed, I'll uh, turn it over to my testimony. Um, and uh, just one second. Um, so, Senator Westrom, your bill is effective, uh, and this is for members too, for sales and purchases made after July 1, 2017. Um, the legislation that was previously passed that dealt with, um, what, as uh, Senator Westrom mentioned, um, telecommunications or pay television services. What was the effective date of that exemption? Madam, Madam Chair, the effective date of that legislation was July 1 of 2017, so this would be fully re retroactive. I to see. That so that w it was retroactive then um, as well. Madam, it passed Madam, in 2019. Madam Chair, no, it was passed in 2017. Oh, so I see. I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. Okay, so this is go this goes back and grabs all of it, and people are able to um, uh, to submit an application for a refund for those um, those purchases back to 2017. Is that correct, Senator Westrom? Uh, Madam Chair, that would be correct. And uh, okay. my understanding, and I'll let Mr. Uh, Brent Christensen uh, fill in the gaps, but uh, the many the, the, the internet providers, uh, many of them also phone companies uh, that have been longstanding uh, providers in our communities for decades, if not centuries, um, they have had to break out the usage of, of uh, fiber that's been installed to kind of 
prorate the portions of of the fiber that have been used for phone and, and uh, cable versus internet, as I recall. But I turn it over to my testifier. Yeah, uh, thank thank you, um, um, Senator Westrom. We just want, we do want to understand the language of the bill first, yes. and and thank you for the clarifications. Um, so. Um, welcome to the committee, Mr. Um, um, Christensen, and we're um, pleased to have your testimony if you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> My name is Brent Christensen, and I'm the president and CEO of the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, or MTA. MTA membership is a mix of family-owned, cooperatives, privately held, publicly traded providers throughout Minnesota. While MTA members have many different corporate structures, one thing we have in common is our commitment to serving Minnesota. And I really appreciate the opportunity. I had testimony to talk to you more about it, but Senator Westrom's covered most of it already, so I'm not going to bore you with reading that. I will give you two examples that have happened um, in the past year. Great. So back in 2017, we really did think we fixed this when we had uh, the sales tax exemption for fiber and conduit, wire, cable, poles, and that, those sort of things. But there was a little caveat in there that slipped by all of us that said it only if it's used for television or telephone service and not for internet. Well, we use cable, our fiber that we put in the ground for all three of those things, so we didn't think anything much of it and we went on. Well, last year, two of my members got sales tax audits. One of the Department of Revenue auditors came in and said, well, you're putting telephone and television on that, so you don't have to pay sales tax on that fiber. Another auditor came in and said, well, you're putting television, telephone, and internet on that fiber that you purchased, so you have to pay sales tax on that portion of that fiber you use for the internet. Uh, and and how, we don't know how to prorate that out because those services go simultaneously. And as most of you know, the world has changed. I mean, it used to be we provided the internet over a telephone line. Now we provo provide telephone service over a broadband connection over, over the fiber we purchased. So this bill would clean it up and fix something that, quite frankly, we didn't know was broken six years ago. And with that, I'm happy to well, answer questions. Well, Mr. Christensen and um, Senator uh, Westrom, the uh, the biggest cost uh, is in the revenue estimate, of course, is the uh, is the catch up part, is the retroactivity, uh, the revenue estimate for uh, FY 2024 is is almost 13 million dollars. But then going forward is a much more modest um, um, exemption amount, um, two and a half million at the, at the most. So we'll take that into consideration as we um, uh, look at this bill. Uh, Madam any Chair, questions for? Um, Madam Chair, if I, if I could, on, on this, I just got this yesterday, uh, last mm -hmm. night. Um, I'm not disputing the, the Department of Revenue's numbers, but I'm, I'm guessing that they're probably taking the total sales of fiber and not the part of the fiber, not the amount of fiber that is already tax exempt. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, that number is the, would be a top number in my mind. Well, the, um, their estimate that we um, are bound by um, is in this first year the catch up amount for those um, items that you just described um, were not done before. And so. Um, uh, from the description, I think they um, they do have it uh, uh, specific to the um, uh, to the items. And if you look at the fourth or fifth, uh, if you look at the revenue analysis detail. Yep. Um, it looks as if that fiber is 50% of the, of the uh, market, and so that's what the revenue estimate is drawn to. So not 100% retroactive that's already been um, exempted, but 50% uh, based on the fact that fiber and con conduit are assumed at this point, and maybe it should even be more, 30% uh, of the total uh, telecommunications expenditure. So I, it's probably accurate. Um, and then, um, uh, but that, in a sense, lends itself to being a one-time cost, which in the tax committee we like. So <laughs> uh, uh, 
and then the ongoing costs in tax committee terms is pretty reasonable. Uh, any any questions, uh, Senator Draskowski? Comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just an observation, Madam Chair. This this appears again to maybe be another. This appears to be another example of a bill that's before us because of action taken by the department. I, and I, we had that discussion in an earlier hearing about the need to commit to our oversight function of the department and uh, at least understand the realities of what is happening there. And if indeed, um, as it, you know, on the surface appears, we might have an activist uh, effort on the department to make changes here. Um, we wouldn't need to have a bill like this before us. So maybe we, could we add this to the list maybe as we look at that effort? Sure. Thank you, um, Senator Skowski. Also, you know, the the uh, the burden of this falls on us as well. We should have been, we should have said, wait a minute, we don't mean just landlines and, and this. Um, uh, how come we didn't read the bill? <laughs> um, the language that was there is what the department did. Um, assuming that they knew what was in our heads, and it wasn't on paper. It wasn't there. So um, uh, we need to have sharp eyes when we're putting anything into um, the tax bill that we actually mean what we say. So, that, so it's on us as well as on interpretations made by the, um, the department. Um, so we'll do that going on. It is, um, oh, and I'm reminded that it is, uh, this is not necessarily, this is for Ms. Bear's um, edification, it's not necessarily a uh, Department of Revenue issue, it's a streamline issue, streamline sales tax issue in terms of uh, definition. So uh, we need to be more careful there as well. Senator um, Putnam. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, I think we all know how I feel about taxation and appurtenances, uh, and this would be another example uh, there you go. of that concern. <laughs> right. um, so I was grateful to see this bill. Um, I actually have a bill that's very similar, virtually identical, actually, uh, that I dropped earlier this session. Uh, the primary distinction is a slightly greater emphasis on the forward-looking components of the tax right. relief rather than the retroactive ones. But in the spirit of the REST doctrine, uh, which is an imperative toward bipartisanship. Uh, I'd like to offer Senator Westrom my support of this bill as well if he'd take me on as a co-author. Senator Westrom. Ma Ma Madam Chair, assuming we have room, it's been a very popular one, so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get you added. <laughs> even, even, if the chair, even if the chief author has to drop off to let you on. <laughs> um, Senator uh, Westrom's uh, Senator Westrom, it appears that you're the only author on this bill right now. So I think I think I, uh, Senator Putnam would be a welcome addition to your bill. Madam, Madam Chair, that was my guess, but I thought I had to add a little humor. <laughs> Senator Weber. Madam Chair, uh, since Senator Putnam asked me to be on his bill, I will piggyback on there as well. So, okay. they're, so they're not lonesome <laughs> there. Thank you. So we're, I will, we're growing exponentially. I will let this bipartisan C rise up. <laughs> and, the uh, Appurtenance Caucus. And you all take care of it among and, yourselves. And, and, uh, and, any other discussion? Seeing none, Senator Westrom, um, Senate file uh, 1063 will be uh, laid over. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, next on our agenda we'll is, is uh, Senate File uh, 2182, uh, Senator Coleman. No one ever comes to us with a proposal to increase sales taxes, but they're very inventive in finding products and services to exempt. And we have this one here today, Senator Coleman. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the time. And I do miss being on this committee with you. If you're having issues with a quorum, we miss you. Um, I am prompt all the time. So maybe we yes, can I chat know. later. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, members, uh, Senate File 2182 is a very straightforward piece of legislation regarding the expansion of sales tax exemptions for baby products, something I'm all too familiar with. 
Under current law, breast pumps, baby bottles, nipples, pacifiers, teething rings, and infant syringes are exempt from sales tax. This bill adds baby wipes, cribs and bassinets, crib and bassinet mattresses, sheets, changing tables, changing pads, strollers, car seats and car seat faces, baby swings, bottle sterilizers, and infant eating utensils to the list of exemptions. I think that given today's economy that this bill is coming at a very good time. I think it doesn't matter how well you try to financially plan to grow your family, unexpected things can come up like inflation, housing costs, or I don't know, twins. <laughs> and uh, that's the bill. It's very straightforward. Um, I believe there is a revenue analysis if council wants to walk through that. Otherwise, I have a few testifiers, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Senator Coleman, the revenue estimate total uh, for this year is uh, $1.7 and it's relatively the same going into the next, uh, this biennium and also the next biennium. Before the testifiers, uh, are there any questions or comments from members? Seeing none, we welcome your testifiers. Senator Coleman. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you. Um, hello, Madam Chair and Senators. Thank you for this opportunity to be before you today. My name is Crystal Dill. I am a mother of a 14-year-old, and soon I will have a newborn. Back about 13 or 14 years ago, my husband was working hard as a self-employed painter. I was working retail, not making much money. Uh, we were living paycheck to paycheck, and sometimes we didn't know when his were going to be there. We didn't know how we would provide food or necessities for ourselves sometimes, let alone provide the needs for our new baby. <laughs> Imagine diapers, wipes, clothing, and the things that seem like luxuries, honestly, that she had mentioned. <laughs> it's like, well, we can't do that. Uh, I remember one day on our way to church, we had hardly any gas in the tank, hardly any diapers left, no money in the bank, and no idea when our next check was coming, but I prayed and I just asked that God would help us, and I just knew that we just needed to be at church that day. After service, Pastor Mike of Redeeming Love, who many of you actually may know, uh, walked up to my husband and I and said he felt God wanted to give us something. He handed us a $20 bill, and I fell on the floor in a puddle of tears <laughs> because I knew that maybe that $20 to someone else was like nothing or a drop in the bucket, but for me, it meant I was going to have diapers, I was going to be able to get through until our next check would come. Um, and I know that I wasn't the only mom going through those emotions at that time, and not every mom receives a gift like this from someone generous. Some parents are left feeling panic and anxiety um, with the paycheck to paycheck reality, which we knew for years, and that remains true today. Fast forward 13 years, and the prices of baby items have gone up dramatically, and the economy is even more challenging for many mothers and families. This can be overwhelming, especially for new parents. I understand the expenses of raising a child, but even more so, I understand the weight of living the paycheck to paycheck reality and the stress that it places on mothers and fathers alike. Based on my personal experiences, I've interacted with young mothers who are in survival mode much of the time having little to no support around them. Um, the, supports, the support to parents offered in this bill is a crucial help to making sure families and their babies are taken care of. Members, as a mother, with firsthand experience, I urge you to help mothers and fathers provide the material support they need to take care of basic infant needs and baby needs. I would love to make Minnesota a more welcoming place for mothers and young families, and I ask that you support this bill, SF-2182. Thank you very much, Ms. Dill. Uh, next, we have um, Maggie. Is it Hangji or Hangi? Hangi. Hangi. And the next person can come up as well, Mary um, Eberhard. Join uh, Senator Coleman. She, Madam Chair, she'll be up shortly. She's got a six-week-old with her. So okay, all right, that's fine. Um, uh, Ms. Hangi. Thank you. Chair Resson, members of the committee, my name is Maggie Hange. I'm the policy associate at the Minnesota Catholic Conference, the public policy voice of the Catholic Church in Minnesota. 
and I'm here today to share our support for SF2182. When a young couple is considering whether to start a family, there's no doubt that the startup costs on items like car seats, cribs, and strollers are daunting. And new parents face the brunt of these costs more than anyone, especially at a time when inflation is so high. On average, a new parent may spend between $12,000 to $20,000 or more on their baby in the first year of his or her life. So when sifting out the costs of items that could be state sales tax free is if SF2182 passes, from a quick search of places like Amazon and Target, on average, a parent will spend nearly $2,000 with the state sales tax on these items totaling about $130. Although 130 out of nearly 2,000 doesn't seem like an overwhelming number, it can make a difference in the lives of new families. With that savings, the parent could in turn purchase their crib mattress and sheets or nearly pay for their changing table. Eliminating this tax is particularly vital for lower income families who are often living pay to, paycheck to paycheck and are more impacted by inflation. A small, t small tax cut for the state could make a life-saving difference when a family can now afford a new safe crib and car seat rather than getting those items already used in a neighborhood swap. Minnesota's facing a demographic cliff. We have not had a replacement fertility levels since 2006, according to the State Dem Demographic Center. With these increasingly low birth rates, offering a small but impact impactful solution to families, like eliminating state sales tax on essential baby items, could help lessen some of the fear felt by prospective parents. And it will not have a significant impact on the state budget with that small number. We hope that everyone can get behind putting families first. Let's help parents and infants by easing the cost of these necessary baby items. Thank you and please vote yes on SF2182. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Ms. Eberhardt. Hi, if you'd I'm identify yourself for the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Mary Eberhard, and I'm a mom of a new six-week-old, um, and we reside in St. Paul. When my husband and I were starting to research some of the big-ticket items as we were preparing for the birth of our daughter, um, we were frustrated and disappointed because we realized the models and brands rated the safest were the ones we wouldn't be able to afford um, when buying baby items. Our priority was and still is the safety and um, health of our baby. And we just realized that those items weren't going to be in the budget. We are fortunate that we had friends and family buy us about $1,500 worth of baby items from baby showers. So we were in a really good position in that way. But we still were left with the biggest items, the car seat, the stroller, um, and the crib, as well as bassinet and nursery furniture um, because we those were the most expensive. Um, if we would have purchased the items that we thought were the best for our baby in terms of health and safety for just the stroller, the crib, and the bass, um, and the car seat, we would have spent $1,000. Um, but since we've chosen to live on one income so I can stay at home and care for our daughter, we really have to be careful about budgeting and these days with inflation, the prices um, increasing, even just grocery shopping is a challenge. And so preparing for our little one, um, we really had to be intentional about where we spent our money and what we chose. Um, so we ended up opting to buy either used, in which case we don't know exactly what kind of wear and tear has those items have been through, or to borrow, in which case in the future if we have another child, we will probably have to buy anyways. Um, and we had to think ahead to things like those hospital bills and the pediatric checkups that were going to be new um, charges and bills that we would have to think about in this year. Um, so this is just kind of difficult and a little, it feels risky to put our child in things that are used when you don't know necessarily, especially things like a car seat, you're, what it's been through. Um, and that's why I'm here to support removing the sales tax um, from these items. Passing SF2182 will be a step towards reducing the cost um, so that other families don't have to feel like they have to compromise when it comes to the quality and safety for their children. Please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you very much. Um, are there again uh, comments or questions for Sarah Coleman? 
Senator Coleman, do you want to make a final comment? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the testifiers, particularly um, bringing your six-week-old baby. I was barely functioning right. at that point, uh, so <laughs> kudos. Uh, yeah, when I you. ran, I promised to do everything I could to make Minnesota an even better place to live, work, and raise a family, and I think this is a little baby step in that direction, and I really appreciate the time and your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Coleman. Senate File 2182 will be laid over. Um, and there, our next bill is also Senator Coleman on a uh, much less, I don't know, interesting maybe <laughs> in some instances. Uh, uh, topic, it is uh, Senate File 1860, sales tax exemption for uh, uh, construction materials. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Interesting, though, to the people of Chanhassen, I think, <laughs> personally. And um, this bill is another pretty straightforward bill regarding construction material sales tax exemption, providing a sales tax exemption for materials and supplies used in and equipment incorporated into the construction, reconstruction, upgrade, expansion, or remodeling of a new city hall, a new senior center, council chambers, and having served on the Chanhassen City Council, I can personally attest to the need for that fix, and certain park amenities in the city of Chanhassen. Um, and I do have uh, one testifier with me, Madam Chair, the Mayor of Chanhassen. Um, welcome, Ma Madam Mayor. We'd be pleased to have your testimony if you would identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members. My name is Elise Ryan, and I am the mayor of Chanhassen. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing Senate File 1860 today. We also want to thank Senator Coleman for having been a consistent, strong champion for our community. Senate File 1860 provides a sales exemption for the construction materials for the city of Chanhassen for our upcoming public facility improvements. Madam Chair and members, as I set, stated, Senate File 1860 provides a sales tax exemption for the city of Chanhassen. Specifically, the bill provides an exemption for our senior center, our council chambers, city hall, and park amenities. The Chanhassen City Hall was built more than 40 years ago when the population of Chanhassen was less than 7,000 people. Mm -hmm. Today, we serve ne nearly 27,000 residents from that same facility, and we continue to grow. The building is difficult for our residents to navigate, and between deferred maintenance needs and operational efficiency needs, it has exceeded its useful life. Chanhassen is a regional destination for services, including the Senior Center, which will be expanded with this project. Madam Chair, Senate File 1860 would reduce the total project costs for our planned facility improvements, and we greatly appreciate your consideration. Thank you for your time today, and we are available for any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor. I will draw members' attention to the uh, description of the project, uh, which is in the, in the packets, as well as the um, uh, revenue estimate. Um, this one is not of note, is not retroactive. It is anticipating the uh, uh, construction. So the first year that um, it would be effective is beginning um, January 31st of 2024. So it's not looking back, it's looking uh, uh, looking forward with an estimated cost of the project of $12 million. Um, uh, Senator Coleman, we have, you know, uh, varying proposals with regard to uh, sales tax exemptions on construction projects paid by contractors on behalf of uh, local governments. We have a um, proposal from the governor that uh, is a blanket for two years. And then we have, um, uh, at a total amount, uh, estimated. And then we have um, individual cities um, coming forward. And we're not yet at the point of making a decision about whether we should have a, a blanket um, proposal that everybody gets part of, or whether it's more prudent to um, okay these individual projects. Um, so we're not we're not exactly sure yet um, what uh, what the best way forward is. But we're very sympathetic, of course, because local governments themselves 
if they're paying directly for these projects, they're exempt from the sales tax, but the complication comes when um, their contractors are the ones that are paying the upfront costs. So mm -hmm. I'm very aware of the situation. Uh, I don't know whether the one way or have lots of exemptions or whether um, uh, we um, will put time constraints on them of some sort and so on, but we are very interested in helping local governments in this way. So, any questions or comments for Senator Coleman on Senate file uh, 1860? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much, Senator Coleman. Thank and you. Uh, uh, Senate oh. file 1860 oh. is laid over. Thank you, Madam thank you, Chair. Madam Chair. Thank you. Right. Senator Eichhorn? Senator Eichhorn um, uh, brings us uh, Senate File 1589. Senator Eichhorn, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to present before your committee today, Senate File 1589. And I always like to start off by thanking my co-sponsors, Senator Housechild, Kupek, and Weber. We do have an extra spot on there if anybody wants on. We took to heart your advice that uh, make it bipartisan and leave a spot there for hope. So we, we got you on both fronts there. So you did. Um, this is a bill um, that simply ex extends the sales tax exemption that the state already has on grooming machines. It extends it to materials and supplies necessary for the development and maintenance of snowmobile trails by nonprofit snowmobile clubs. This bill will also clarify the current exemption for groomers includes necessary repair parts and attachments. Uh, you think like a car, these groomers are a big tractor-like machine and just like your car, they require a lot of maintenance, so it clarifies that piece as well. Minnesota has over 22,000 miles of snowmobile trails and there's been a public partnership between uh, state and local governments and nonprofit snowmobile clubs that's resulted in one of the finest, or I would, I would argue the finest snowmobile system in the entire country, if not the world. We're very blessed to have the system we do in this state. Um, of the 22,000 miles of trails, 20,000 miles of those are grant and aid trails on private land. Uh, under the snowmobile grant and aid system, the DNR contracts with local units of government who then um, you know, contract with the, the snowmobile clubs to help develop and maintain the trails. The clubs are made up of all volunteers and often the clubs raise additional money to help fund some of this work to keep our trails maintained and in good shape so that all Minnesotans can enjoy them. Uh, snowmobile clubs obtain permits and e easements from private landowners uh, for use of the trails. Landowners grant permission without compensation and of course the trails again are open to all Minnesotans. The system relies on volunteer clubs, volunteer landowners. Without this system of volunteerism, the system would collapse. Simply the state could not afford to maintain the system without leveraging the volunteer spirit of participants. The trails are in constant need of grooming and maintenance. This requires the ongoing purchase of materials and supplies and the sales tax on those materials and supplies place an undue financial strain on these small snowmobile clubs that purchase those products. Think of things like if they have to replace a bridge, you might have to go to Home Depot and buy lumber or stake posts, things to, to mark trails, things of that type of nature are things you often see clubs purchase. The legislature has already recognized the public benefit, benefit of the snowmobile grant and aid system by exempting the purchase of snowmobile or of groomer machines from the sales tax. Uh, the fiscal impact of this is pretty minimal. When we uh, did this bill in a previous session, um, in a tax bill that didn't end up getting through, it was $14,000. I just saw the fiscal note for the first time today. I see it's uh, 50,000 in 24 and about 60,000 ongoing. Uh, kind of joke, that's, that's almost a rounding error to the state, of, you know, to the Department of Revenue, but to these, snow, these small snowmobile clubs that do so much work for our trail system, mm -hmm. it means a world of a difference to them and will allow them to do more to continue to maintain our trails and keep the wonderful system we have for all Minnesotans and of course the visitors we have come to our state for our wonderful system as well. So with that, Madam Chair, I'm gonna turn it over to our testifier. I have a um, couple questions first. Oh and yeah. Maybe, maybe sure. your um, testifier can answer them as well. So Senator Eichhorn, is there anything left with regard to um, this, this area that remains taxable that you should be thinking about asking 
for other things that are associated with these snowmobile clubs um, uh, that uh, someone is going to ask, well, if that's not taxable, how come this is um, within um, the operation of these uh, snowmobile clubs and, and for that industry? Uh, you don't have to answer that off the top of your head, but if, if there is something, I hope that you will let us know. That's a great question, Madam Chair. And uh, I'm sure my, my testifier that's here with us today, he's, he uh, represents MNUSA, the, one of the, snow, okay. the largest snowmobile association in the state. He might be able to add some context to that as part of his uh, presentation. But I do agree with you, instead of coming back every year for something right. little, it'd be nice to take care of it all at once. We appreciate the, the question. Sure. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn. Um, uh, uh, if you'd identify yourself for the uh, record, we're pleased to have your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Doug Franzen, and Mr. I represent Franzen. the Minnesota United Snowmobilers Association. Um, I think my job today here is to fill in any blanks, but Senator Reichorn did an amazing job, so there's not many. Uh, Mr. Franzen, could you move the mic a little bit closer? A little bit closer. Is this Thank better? You. Yes, All that's right. much better. My name's Doug, uh, and I'm a lobbyist. I um, primarily are answering questions, would like to answer questions, and the first question would be the chairs. Um, I believe with this bill, uh, and within the scope of the law and what we believe is proper, these are the only items that we can in good faith say should be tax exempt. So I think we've got it covered. Uh, there's obviously a lot of other things we'd like to have uh, tax exempt, but I can't with a straight face say they should be. Um, Thank you. A couple uh, other questions, not questions, but um, I'm going off script for a second when I saw Senator Dibble. Just to note that for a lot of folks um, in greater Minnesota, the snowmobile is not, so, not primarily a recreation vehicle, but a transportation vehicle. They get to work. They go to school on their snowmobiles. Um, and that's something, as a city person, um, I grew up in the city and still live here, um, I never knew. But when I met my friends from the Snowmobile Association, and uh, I discovered it, it's a utility vehicle. Farmers use them, uh, and they're a primary means of transportation for a lot of folks during the winter. Just to say what we're talking about, I, I drew one county, Scott County, um, which is a heavy user of the kind of materials that would be covered. So this covers one extreme. Uh, some cl snowmobile clubs may have, even within the context of minimal use. But Scott County has 25, 225 miles of trail. Every year they um, place and remove over 3,500 signs, directional signs, stop signs, etc., all on private land. Of those, they have to replace the signposts, about 600 of them every year. And essentially, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with the snowmobile trail, a sign, the post itself is essentially just a piece of rebar with prongs on the bottom so it doesn't pull up. But for various reasons, a lot of them are damaged or stolen. Over the, they live, uh, there's a lot of flooding in the area of the trails in Scout County. So that in the last year, they had to replace three bridge decks at a total cost of $7,000. There are 200 snowmobile grooming clubs in the state. And doing my ninth grade math, that uh, the fiscal note comes out to about $3,000 a year per club that would be uh, tax exempt, that would fall within here, the tax exemption. Uh, personally, I think that's a little high, but not so high that it's worth quibbling about. Uh, and frankly, I cannot come up with a better methodology or a better metric to second guess revenue. Um, with that, uh, Madam Chair, I 
would just reemphasize what Senator Eichhorn has said. This is terribly important to these clubs who are struggling. Fuel costs have gone through the roof for the groomers. Um, there's a lot of ancillary fundraising mechanisms we do to make ends meet. This would mean a great, great deal to all clubs throughout the state. And with that, Madam Chair, if members have any questions, I can talk about snowmobiling all day. Any questions or comments for um, Senator uh, Eichhorn or his witness? Senator Dibble? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As long as uh, I was invoked, I thought I would respond. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, mention to members, uh, in, in case it hadn't been mentioned, the uh, grant and aid program is funded through what we call unrefunded gas tax. So gas tax that's attributable to snowmobile use because, of course, they don't go on the highways, the state highways or the county roads or municipal state aid streets. So that's the rationale for you know, not, not taxing. And so, and so then those dollars are given to these clubs for the purpose of creating and grooming the trails. Likewise, I believe snowmobile stickers and snowmobile registration fees are used for grant and aid. Yeah, um, sure. The amount um, that's determined, you know, it's quasi scientific, quasi just kind of this is the amount that's needed and this is the amount that we've given in the past. It's not precise. It's in the neighborhood of what, three or four million dollars from the gas tax? I'm not, I believe I'm not so. Sure. All right, so that's that's how that works. Thank you, um, thank you uh, Senator Dibble. I think that's an important yeah. uh, part of who is eligible to get yeah. this, and um, that's certainly in this legislation. Um, Mr. Franson, did you have a further yes, comment? Yes, Madam Chair. First, I apologize for responding to Senator Dibble. I should have gone through the chair, so I forget that. Senator Dibble, uh, Chair Dibble is absolutely correct. Of the snowmobile snowmobile funding, uh, it comes from two sources, from two dedicated funds. Actually, uh, approximately half of our funding comes from the unrefunded gas tax and is, trans and is attributed into the uh, snowmobile dedicated fund. The other half uh, comes from our registration fees. Um, I have represented. Uh, Minnesota United Snowmobilers Association for a quarter of a century. And I'm proud that of all the fee increases over the years, um, we have initiated all but one. And the one, uh, DNR got the jump on us once, and we did support them in that. So uh, we believe in doing our own share. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Anyone else have a comment or a question for Senator Eichhorn? Seeing none, um, uh, Senator Kyle, uh, what is it here? 1589 is laid over. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, um, Senator thank, Eichhorn. Thank, Mr. You. thank you, Madam Chair. And I will also add one more thing. Every year, MNUSA does a snowmobile ride that's open for legislators and staff. and. We get a few members every year, so it's already happened this year, but next year we'd love to see some of you join us. We'd love to see you get on a sled, Madam Chair. They do have them provided and helmets and everything you need. It's, it's a really fun day and a great opportunity for legislators to get to, to know more about the industry and the great trail system we have. So I just wanted to put that plug in. Thank you, um, Senator Eichhorn, uh, you. for your gracious invitation. Um, uh, the next bill, um, Senator Klein is uh, Senate file 1957. Um, before I do that, um, uh, however, um, the um, since the last two bills are mine, um, and Senator um, Klein will then um, uh, adjourn the committee when we get to that point. I had s spoken. Um, um, before that we were moving um, bills with zero cost to uh, to the floor um, and uh, probably not being acted on, but we wanted to show uh, support from the committee. Uh, and so we have uh, three of those bills uh, today, and the chair of the House, uh, 
Taxes Committee has been informed. Um, so uh, Senator uh, Klein moves that Senate file 331, uh, Senator Hoffman, it is the Green Acres bill, um, be recommended to pass. All those in favor of that motion? So I gotta do this. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Um, the next bill is Senate File 580. Um, this was the tax court petition modification. Senator Weber moves that Senate File 580, it does not need to go to uh, judiciary, um, be recommended to pass. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Uh, the next one is Senate File 801. This is the City of Virginia dealing with the debt limit exemption. Senator Klein moves that Senate File 801 be recommended to pass. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Uh, the motion prevails. We will now continue to Senate File 1957. Sam's going to take all this stuff to the table for you. Okay, can you? Welcome to the committee, Senator Rest. Senate File 1957 is before the committee. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate File 1957 um, uh, is a bill dealing with Class 4D property and making changes to that. And so I have um, the A1 amendment that I move now. Senator Rest moves the A1 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The A1 is adopted. To your motion. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much. If you have questions about um, the A1 amendment, it really is addressing uh, the um, uh, issues of um, land trusts, um, local trusts. Um, that is a particular topic of interest to Senator Dibble, and he has a bill on it as well. And we are including um, some, not all of what was in your bill, but some of what was in your bill as we create two, two parts of, um, uh, of uh, 4D property, uh, allowing um, the... Uh, uh, those properties that in the community land trusts that are used as a um, uh, that are used as a homestead by the occupant rather than as a um, uh, straightforward um, renter and creating with this amendment as well a separate um, classification that will be uh, classified as uh, 4D2, and the low-income rental properties will continue as 4D1. So briefly, through the um, through the bill, um, the uh, as I mentioned to start with, and I bet I'm not talking well enough. Am I? Sorry. This is my cheat sheet. 
or the statute book on on uh, uh, 40 property. So I have something to refer to, um, as well as the good offices of Mr. Sylvia. Um, so it starts out in section one, uh, discussing the community land chest land trusts and setting up this class 4D2 um, uh, classification. Um, section two is our technical uh, changes, and and we're familiar with the provisions that are in this bill. We have heard them before, and not just last year, but um, but we've been working on this for. Um, for some time, this is a program, uh, the 4D property, that uh, was begun in the uh, mid-90s and uh, to deal with issues of trying to make good partnerships with um, uh, landlords and developers who are uh, committed to uh, low-income rental properties, um, but also making sure that those who are occupants truly do have um, what would be considered a lower income, so that there's a win-win situation, um, and the win for the developers is um, a lower class rate, and the win for the tenants is lower rents. Um, but there were um, issues with wondering what kind of guardrails there should be on these projects uh, we were noticing that in some communities there came to be, um, quite frankly, an overabundance of, uh, of 4D property. And of course, when one class of property has a lower rate um, and you add more of that kind of property, the um, budget responsibilities um, uh, for a given city, in particular smaller cities, is where it's an a real issue is um, it's just transferred on to, they don't cut their budgets, they still need to provide um, streets and lights and whatever, um, but the burden falls on other, um, on other properties in the, in the jurisdiction. So one of the guardrails comes up now in section three um, where um, uh, new properties that are projects that are being proposed um, have to win local um, approval. So anybody who owns a property that wants to offer 4D, um, they need to get uh, approval from the, um, from the uh, local government in which, in that city where the uh, project is going to be um, um, going to be built, and not only the local approval, but if you look at um, page three, line 13, we are being responsive to those cities that, that um, uh, uh, perhaps got out of balance with regard to their 4D property. And um, so in line, page three, line 13, if the pro property is in a city, in which the uh, net tax capacity of the 4D1 now property uh, did not exceed 2% of the total net tax capacity, um, the property owner does not need to receive the approval under this subdivision. So it's when, uh, when a developer and owner wants to go beyond that, um, that the uh, local approval uh, uh, requirement kicks in. Um, section section four um, uh, is uh, a conforming change to other parts of the bill and just describes the application for for D property um, and um, the um, in section five, which lasts for a number of pages. Um, and it is just the qualifications there. But um, so if you go to uh, paragraph E, page 10, line 5, uh, what does class 4D property include? And the first paragraph is more or less a technical one, uh, changing from 4D to 4D1, 
for the original tent of 4D property. And then, um, uh, and this particularly again for Senator Dibble on page 10, line 15, the community land trust uh, properties um, is where the occupant is uh, the property, uses a property um, as a, um, as a homestead and no particular uh, accommodation is made for the assessment of that property. The market value, if you look at 10, page 10, line 20, the market value should be determined by, or must be determined by the assessor based on um, the normal approach. Now, I'm not quite sure, um, and this would be a question for Mr. Sylvia, um, if there is somewhere in law a, um, a definition of normal approach, um, uh, I would think it has to somehow apply to best practices and use and so forth. Um, then um, the, um, one of the things that we've changed over the time in, in a complicated formula is how how is Class 4D property to be taxed? What's the tax rate? And um, we uh, had a single rate, and then we went to a, a bifurcated rate um, that uh, you have to reach a certain amount of value before you get the lowest rate. Um, and what was happening over time is we had... Um, uh, we had uh, uh, increasing uh, values so that getting to the, the threshold, the lower rate, um, became more and more uh, difficult. And so um, uh, two years ago, three years ago, we um, were interested, the legislature interested, with some pushback um, on... Um, uh, what if we called a halt on those escalating values and for two years just set the rate for for um, a 4D property at um, with valuations at a hundred thousand and um, that's what we've been operating under and this makes a change in that was a temporary thing just to have a look back provisions so under this bill which is one that we then took up again last year uh, class 4D has a, we'll have a rate of um, 0.25, and the class 4.2, uh, um, 4.2, that is the community land trust property, will have a rate of 0.75. Uh, the, um, in section six, um, another what I would consider guardrail, the, um, uh, and this would be November a year from now, uh, we're asking the counties to identify 10 properties located within the county with the greatest number of units uh, classified as 4D, and this is on page 11, line 6. Um, and then after that, after doing that, that um, we ask the county to uh, survey each property owner um, as to how each owner, we're talking about the, you know, the developer, owner, whatever, um, uh, use the property tax savings that they got uh, resulting from this change in the uh, property uh, class rate um, for, um, uh, for, for 4D. And then to make a report on that by the following March to the uh, Commissioner of Revenue. Um, so at the end now, uh, so we have these properties, and in some places, there it is a burden, a true burden, um, uh, of um, uh, uh, shifting burden onto the rest of the uh, rest of the properties in a municipality. And so we have a um, proposing a um, uh, a transition aid um, to um, ease that. Uh, Ease that, or acknowledge—not ease it so much, but acknowledge that burden—and um, 
for 25 and 26, which, which have been, of course, we can review in the next biennium, um, we have a formula to determine what the transition aid um, uh, should be, and then we provide for an appropriation that is sufficient to um, pay that. If you look on the, um, oh, I should have it here, the, uh, well, I get, where am I? Uh, yes. Um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, revenue estimate kicks in in, in uh, year 26 and 27 at an amount of uh, $3 million for that, uh, for that purpose. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, that is, um, that is the bill. It is um, uh, a repeat of uh, former bills, and it also um, recognizes um, suggestions, improvements, uh, including adding the 4D2 um, property and, um, uh, and acknowledging and supporting the guardrails um, suggested by any number of um, interested parties. So, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, that is Senate File 1957. Thank you, Senator Rest, for presentation of the bill. And I have three testifiers on our scheduled agenda. And we'll begin with uh, Mr. Eric Johnson. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Chair and committee members, I'm Dr. Eric Anthony Johnson, President and CEO of Aon, here to testify in support of Senate File 1957. Aon is one of Minnesota's leading nonprofit housing providers. Since 1986, we've built, purchased, or renovated more than 6,000 units in the Twin Cities, and we provide housing stability for more than 17,000 Minnesotans each year. Aon is one of 20 members of the Ad Hoc 4D Coalition. This coalition of nonprofit and for-profit affordable housing developers and operators collectively provide more than 90% of the state's low-income housing rentals. I want to thank Senator Ress for authorizing this bill and for her long-standing leadership in the area of affordable housing. I want to thank the other members of the committee who worked on this issue on a bipartisan basis last session, Senators Weber, Klein, Nelson, and Desick. For the past decade, the state's policy has recognized the importance of treating low-income rental units, so-called class 4D properties, more favorably in the taxation of real property than market rate housing. However, we've seen taxes on our affordable renters skyrocket. In the meantime, as market rate properties, valuations have dramatically increased our low-income units valuations. This increased property tax burden has imposed enormous pressure on operating budgets. In Aon's case, the combined property tax increase across our portfolio in the past decade is several million dollars, money which we could rather invest in properties and use to leverage additional financing for more projects. The property tax class rate change in Senator Rest's bill would be a game changer for affordable housing in Minnesota. It would benefit large operators, small nonprofits, and for profits. NOAA properties and low-income housing tax credit properties, metro and rural. To solve the long-standing affordable housing crisis in our state requires many tools in a toolbox. This is just one tool, but it is an extremely important one, one which is perhaps the single most cost-effective tool which you can provide. A revenue department study conducted two years ago showed that the change would result in only very modest property tax shifts in the most impacted municipalities. The direct cost to the state would be modest relating to the property tax refund program interaction as well as state transactions aid for cities experiencing greater property tax shifts. In several years, I'm sorry, after several years of this committee working on and perfecting a solution with affordable housing operators and others, stakeholders, we appreciate your consideration and ask for your support for critically needed help. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. 
Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And as you clear the table, could Mr. Nathan Jessen please come forward? Ms. Cecile Bador, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Great. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for the opportunity to participate today, and a sincere thank you for your thoughtful consideration of this bill. We, too, want to thank you, Senator uh, Russ, for authoring this bill, and I want to uh, thank you, too, Mr. Weber, for all your, Senator Weber, rather, of all your leadership last session. Uh, my name is Cecile Bedore. I serve as the Executive Vice President of Real Estate for Common Bond Communities. We are a nonprofit affordable housing developer, property manager, and service provider. We're founded in St. Paul. We were founded over 50 years ago, and our service area includes Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Rapid City, South Dakota, with the vast majority of our units and those we serve in the state of Minnesota. We serve nearly 10,000 people, including seniors, families, veterans, and others in suburban, urban, uh, and rural communities, both in the metro and uh, greater uh, in the metro and greater Minnesota. While developing affordable housing is the focus of my current role, affordable housing has been a common thread throughout my professional experience working to address the mortgage foreclosure crisis and finding resources to support additional affordable multifamily housing was a focus of my time during, uh, as I served as planning and economic development director for the city of St. Paul. And when I served as executive vice president for Greater MSP, a regional economic development organization, housing affordability was not only highlighted as an issue by business owners, but also called out as an imperative to the health of our economy. We know how affordable housing has a positive impact on our state's economy, but more importantly, we know the critical human impact, the impact on all of our neighbors. Economic stability and self-reliance begin with a safe, dignified, affordable place to simply rest so you can get up and do it all over the next day. We all have that, that uh, luxury. I've previously testified before this body about how critical this bill is to, to the sustainable operations of our portfolio and others like ours. We have needed this change in 40s for, 4D for years and we are now at a tipping point. In December, nearly 68% of our residents had verified incomes below 30% of area median income. The average annual income of our residents is $21,000 a year. Our ability to continue to serve and to serve those that the general market simply does not serve and produce more units is sincerely jeopardized by the combination of reductions in rental income, extraordinary increases that we've seen in other operating costs, such as insurance, utilities, labor, security, and critically property taxes. From 2018 to 2022, our property taxes increased 20%. This is simply unsustainable. This trend is a real threat. It's not theoretical. This is a threat to our ability to continue to serve those most vulnerable in our communities, as well as low-wage workers who are critical to our economy's engine. Let me just share a couple of examples for you. Valley Square is a 25-unit, 100% affordable family site in Golden Valley. Property taxes there have gone up 21%. As a result, that property cannot pay its bills, so Common Bond has not only had to forego its property management fees, we've also had to provide cash advances so this property can pay the bills. Another example is Town Club. This is a 40-unit, 100% Section 8 community in Rochester. Property taxes have increased there nearly 27%. Common Bond, again, had to forego property management and other fees, and these are fees that pay staff, HR, finance, by the pens, by the copier, by the paper. And again, Common Bond has had to continually provide cash advances so that property can pay its bill. This, our properties in our organization, as you can imagine, simply cannot sustain these increases. This legislature is contemplating historic investments in affordable housing, investments that we strongly support. For those dollars to be successfully deployed, we must ensure the properties can operate. This bill is critical to ensuring newly developed units are financially viable. Without this bill, the amount of debt a property can support will continue to decline and gaps will go up, ultimately reducing the number of new units that can be developed with the new resources you all are considering. One final point that I think is important to acknowledge here is that like market rate operators, we are not immune to market volatility volatility rather, and pandemic impacts. And, we've ha and we have the same expenses and more. For example, compliance paperwork and verification, et cetera, required by our lenders, investors, including the state of Minnesota, is significant and requires Common Bond to more heavily staff our sites and staff a full compliance department simply to prepare, submit, and monitor reams of compliance requirements. And many of those we serve, again, not served by the market, need support to ensure their housing stability. And those services 
needs have escalated, particularly in the last three years. We strive really hard to provide those services, and our properties do not support that as well. Again, thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair, or I'm sorry, Senator Rust, um, for supporting this bill. I cannot emphasize enough how critical it is to realize the original intent of the 4D legislation. I just want to tell you this one bill, this one action will provide remarkable relief and help ensure the stability of affordable housing communities across the state of Minnesota. Thanks very much for your consideration. Well, thank you, Ms. Bedore. And Mr. Nathan Jessen, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you. My name is Nathan Jessen. Uh, I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, and I want to thank the uh, committee for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the League supports the current 4D low-income rental classification program that provides the class rate reduction uh, on, in property taxes to qualifying low-income rental units. I want to thank Chair Rest and other members of the committee that have worked on, on this uh, with the League on this issue. The League also supports the changes in the bill that provide a class rate reduction of uh, 0.75 to the community land trust properties. Um, our primary concerns uh, around this issue are around the elimination of the first tier class rate on the 4D1 rental units, which creates a more substantial uh, impact on the property tax base. Um, so moving that, that rate down from 0.75 to 0.25 on the first $100,000 of value is going to create a shift onto other properties. Um, and the 2021 legislature, when this issue was looked at uh, prior, at that point in time, the class break was actually at $174,000 in value. So what the legislature did at that point was say, okay, we're going to reset the rate from one, the break from 174 to $100,000 in value and freeze it for two years. Um, so that did address at the time the concerns that the, the benefit of the second tier and the lower rate there wasn't uh, capturing as much value as it may have been intended to in 2013. The other thing to consider about the 2021 law change is that it was put in effect for assessment year 22 and payable year 23. So the 40 properties are gonna benefit from that law change for the first time this May. Um, we do appreciate the local approval uh, provision in Section 3, which requires an initial applicant to receive local approval. That provision doesn't apply to existing property owners that may only have a portion of their units designated as 4D, that may want to transition more of those uh, existing non-4D units to 4D. We also appreciate the transition aid in Section 7. Uh, it is important to note, though, that the aid provided is only for two years and is static without regard to any new 4D units and existing or new buildings that come online. Uh, we have been involved in previous conversations with uh, the bill author and advocates on how to balance and mitigate the increased tax burden on an existing property tax base, which in some jur specific jurisdictions is substantial due to the 4D class rate reduction from 0.75 to 0.25. Uh, we also just want to ensure that any expansion of the program results in increased benefits for renters of 40 units and not just the landlords that rent to them. Though we do appreciate the savings report in section, section six of this bill. Uh, we strongly believe that expanding the program must balance the substantial property tax incentives for uh, owners of low income units with the additional financial impact of the broader, broader property tax base who will bear the responsibility of the redistributed taxes. Uh, we'll continue to work with the bill author on our concerns and possible solutions for the meaningful change to the program that better minimizes the potential property tax increases to existing residents. Thank you, Mr. Jessen. Senator Rest. Um, I have a question for Mr. Jessen. Um, does the league have a position on the proposal dealing with, in here, of creating the 4D2 um, on the community land trust? We haven't, I don't believe I've yeah. had a conversation we're, we're, we're with generally Mr. Support, we're generally, sorry, Mr. Chair. Senator Rest, uh, we're generally supportive okay. of that of that provision. Okay, thank Senator you. Senator Rest, questions or comments from members on the bill? Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Rest, for the bill. Um, just a couple of observations. One thing um, I was reading the uh, the existing uh, prior to the amendment chapter or section six uh, that deals with the report and. Um, Madam Chair, I don't know how valuable that report will be. I mean, money is fungible, so, I mean, if I'm a company that's developing houses or apartment buildings, um, for me to uh, 
uh, and maybe the, the testifier over here could could weigh in on that. But mm -hmm. I mean, I own a small business. I know other members do too. Um, uh, and large businesses, you know, um, would have the same, maybe a similar outlook on it. The question is, is there any value to the report? I mean, you could say, well, the savings is going to be used uh, for additional capital expenditures, which I, I mean, build more buildings, right? And that, and all I think, that's the first thing that people would look to, or uh, certainly uh, to help the bottom line. But I mean. You could claim that it would be used for security or any of these other things. I just don't know the utility, Madam Chair, at least as I read it, of uh, Section 6 in the bill. Uh, the other question I have, um, just to maybe prompt discussion of the committee, is, um, you know, this would, further, would make a very complex property tax system even more complex. We've got 55 uh, different... Um, classifications in Minnesota at last time I checked maybe it's 56 or 57 now uh, some states have three or four and I know in the house in the past uh, we've actually had efforts to condense it and make the property system less complex very a very politically hard thing to do um, mm -hmm. but really I think most people if you ask them will suggest that that's the direction we need to go this will add even one more classification to a very complex property tax system. Uh, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator uh, Rest. Mr. Chairman, um, take the second one first. Um, I, there have been attempts over the years uh, to um, reconfigure the um, property tax rates and, the, the, uh, and classifications of property and um, I don't. I don't believe there's any record of us truly making it more simple, um, and that has, uh, just as in the income tax system, uh, or in the sales tax system, <laughs> um, where we're looking, uh, you know, here's another exemption. Why should there be any exemptions at all when we could have everything taxable in the sales tax and just have an extremely uh, low rate. How great the stability would be if we could do that. But we constantly have um, uh, uh, proposals that um, interrupt that kind of thinking, and we have here um, an additional uh, class rate in the sales tax exemptions. We had them yet today um, on the baby products. Um, we have that. We have that coming, and and my next bill is going to do the same thing, <laughs> and um, uh, I I think it becomes um, uh, a it's a balancing act that's up to the legislature um, in their uh, wisdom or policy making oversight of whether it's valuable to uh, um, to do that. Um, so that that's a really broad uh, issue that comes up all the time. We hear it about ag properties to um, relative homestead. There is no state in the country that has a more complicated. And I know and you're smiling, um, but those of you that represent Senator Weber, um, Senator Oskowski, um uh, more rural areas know how important that particular um, that particular classification is for uh, Minnesota's farm families and their extensive um, uh, uh, efforts uh, to maintain those farm family properties um, and not drive particularly younger farmers um, off the land. Um, the report, section six, um, I, um, I hope that we keep that in there for at least this one time around to see if indeed it is um, a, um, uh, uh, a product that does not, um, does not inform us better about the value of this program uh, or holding it 
uh, will this seem to be be seen to be um, an effort at um, accountability, or will it be a report like so many reports uh, that we have that just goes on the shelf and is not paid any attention to uh, with regard to uh, possible um, policy changes? I'm hoping that's not the case here, but certainly going forward, be, you know, for the next two years. Um, as we move with these changes, um, uh, uh, open to and, and would support a review of, well, did it make any difference? And um, if it doesn't make any difference, then we should delete it. Um, but I'm not sure that that's where we are yet, so that's why it's in there. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think it's going to be the latter, Madam Chair. I think it's going to go on the shelf. Uh, I do uh, listen to my counties, and uh, they talk about unfunded mandates. This is another one. Um, I don't think we should be passing them on to them for something that we question whether there's utility in it or not. Um, I, anyway, uh, that's that's my take on it. And mm -hmm. the effort that I talked about earlier was an effort to consider uh, collapsing the system, Madam Chair, it wasn't actually a, an observation that there's ever been a, a collapsing of the system. I remember Representative Whalen had a bill years ago to um, to look at doing that, and uh, she was attacked on multiple fronts. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, in her, how far did her, that get? In, in a very <laughs> ambitious bill, which I thought was was good um, for us to to try to go in that direction, but it seems like a one-way check valve that we're uh, in the middle of here. It's, it goes one way and won't go back the other in terms of the number of classifications we have. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Rest. Uh, thank you for bringing this bill. I know um, it's, it's complicated and we've been working on it for a number of years and uh, I have, um, generally been supportive, and I think there's additional things in this bill that are an improvement uh, over, over over previous bills. And uh, just to state that the goal of affordable housing is a worthy goal. And so I think this is a worthy and, and needed proposition. Um, but with that said, I just have two um, kind of questions ov overall. One is pretty uh, has been somewhat handled with the classification rate. I remember my first term on this tax committee, I think you were vice chair then, Madam Chair, I think it was uh, Senator Scoy, uh, we had this, uh, was our chair then, and we had this particular committee to look at all of these different property tax classifications and how could we simplify them. And uh, as you noted, I, I don't know that we have uh, simplified them uh, because it reminds me of uh, something that I've also learned around here is that just like every mandate has a constituency, that's why it's there and that's why it's hard to get rid of, it seems that every property class has a constituency as well. So it makes it a, a little difficult. But my broader question is, so, this uh, proposal, uh, in the one hand, we're wanting to uh, make sure that those rents stay affordable, and, and that's the genesis of the report, to make sure the savings from this go back into maintaining those um, affordable housing units. And I, I applaud that report. I hope we can see some goodness uh, out of that and see where those dollars go. So we're protecting, in a sense, what we should do with affordable housing, making, the ho making sure the housing is more affordable. Uh, but, and then on the other end, though, it looks like we also are providing incentives to the developers to develop this affordable housing. And my, I'm hoping you can persuade me that this is wrong, but it seems like there's this hole in the middle where it's, where, who, where is this tax going to be shifted onto? It's going to be shifted onto middle-class Minnesotans that aren't getting any aid for their uh, housing to make it more affordable. And, th and that's my concern, uh, particularly in this time of high escalation of property values and the property taxes that go with it. So it's just a comment uh, to just, that it's just a concern that I have. And I know there's other pieces in our tax bills coming out of this committee likely that may address the middle class property tax holders. 
but I, I think they, all, they have to go together in a sense. So thank and you. And Senator Rust, before you respond, we have two more people on the list for questions, and we'd like to wrap this up in a, about the next five minutes. Senator Rust. Okay, um, I'll, I'll be I'll be brief, although I could talk for a long time on this. Um, but uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Nelson, we have uh, in the bill that's going to be coming forward the omnibus bill any number of um, uh, programs attempts to bring um, property tax relief to everyone, um, uh, not just um, uh, not just lower uh, income uh, folks, but um, certainly the bills that Senator Klein has about um, the property tax refund program, um, uh, particularly special refunds, which will benefit uh, more affluent um, Minnesotans. And um, and uh, the increases that the governor's proposed and that we have supported in the past of increases in uh, local government aids. Um, that's not those local government aids aren't to expand budgets. They're to bring the purpose of them is lowering property taxes. So I think they're. Um, um, I, I actually regret that. Um, other than the local government aids, that the um, governor's proposals did not include more property tax relief for individual renters. Uh, we're going to propose and, and have in front of us the renters, the changes in the renters' credit, moving it into uh, this biennium so that you are in this year, so that um, the, um, uh, the renters' credit uh, can be applied for at the same time that you file a um, uh, a property tax, uh, 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 your income tax. So um, the legislature, uh, in my mind, and, and perhaps appropriately so, um, plays a far greater role in looking at um, the property tax system, as complicated as it is, than um, uh, than than the governor. And um, and that's been true for any and all administrations that, that we've had. We've never really involved, for example, um, uh, any administration, and this 4D goes way back to the mid-1990s. Um, uh, you know, we didn't ask Governor Ventura or Governor Pawlenty uh, or Governor Dayton about it. It's a legislative initiative because we're closest to those property taxpayers in a way that the uh, uh, executive branch is not. So that's my answer to that. Senator Weber. Oh, Senator Nelson, did you have a follow-up? Just a brief short uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And I did I did just want to get those oh. items on the table because they're important as we discuss property taxes. And I'm particularly happy to hear about the renters no harm, no tax fact. credit going forward. Uh, one time money, good use there last year. Senator Weber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would just comment as it relates to creating more complexity in the system. Uh, I think that with the reducing this to one rate uh, for for value rather than having a split uh, does provide uh, some additional simplicity to an already complex system. And I would also comment that uh, as it relates to the report, uh, I understand exactly what Senator Draskowski is talking about. Uh, I do know that that uh, we did direct uh, in previous years uh, that if you go to page eleven, uh, the report shall include uses identified by type, including but not limited to property maintenance, property security, property improvements, property operations, rent stabilization, and increases in the property's capital expenditure fund balances. Uh, we're trying to make sure that there is a level of specificity in the report that actually provides some meaningful analysis. Whether we'll accomplish that uh, remains to be seen, but I think we recognized what you were saying before because certainly we see a lot of reports that gather dust, so. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll just be very brief. I just wanted to thank Senator Rest for including the Community Land Trust 4D2 proposal. Um, it, it will make a big difference uh, for those who 
um, opt into or, or come into affordable home ownership through that uh, mechanism. Um, for those who are not familiar with community land trusts, and apologize if everyone is, um, the idea of land trusts, of course, is that uh, folks who are uh, buying a house for the first time, who are, typically, are low income, they're uh, income limited, um, buy the house, but then the property underneath is held uh, in a in a trust, and so so that's uh, maintained. You know that that cost is is maintained by the organization. Folks own the house, yet um, they upon sale of the house, they don't fully participate in the equity gain um, of that sale, and so it seemed to make sense to um, limit their exposure to uh, property tax valuation increase, and so this will make this idea uh, much more viable for a lot of folks who are coming into home ownership and those who are in home ownership at this point. So it's a, it's a good plan. I've been trying to get it done for many years, and this is the first time it's had legs, so I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sen Thank Madam you. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. And uh, Senator Rest, you can respond to Senator Dibble and also closing comments on the bill. I'm sorry, say again? Closing comments on the bill, Senator Rest. Oh, I have no further comments. I'd rather go on to the next bill. Uh, and with that, we will lay Senate File 1957 over for, as amended, over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Senator Rest, Senate File 2124 is before the committee. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have the A2 amendment. Senator Rest moves the A2 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The A2 amendment is adopted to your bill, Senator Rest. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Senate File 2124. Um, uh, grants a sales tax exemption to a new category. Um, in years past, we have um, uh, the legislature in general, I believe, has been um, sympathetic to the um, situation in which um, restaurant owners find themselves um, regarding their heavy um, equipment. And what we've tried to do in giving them um, uh, relief, like we give to manufacturers for their capital equipment, we have tried to shoehorn um, the heavy equipment, um, refrigerators and so forth, the big ones, um, into a capital equipment definition. Um, in further work this year, um, and I really appreciate the work of Ms. Pollock on this. Um, it, it really doesn't work, again, um, with regard to streamlined definitions. And so instead of um, saying that this equipment is capital equipment, we have in instead um, uh, created a new, um, a new exemption. does the same thing. Um, but it doesn't run afoul of the definitions that we would otherwise have in, um, um, in Streamline. It makes the, uh, the, um, the amendment makes it clear that these are, um, uh, these are substantial expenses that are borne by the, um, the restaurant owners and um, do not in any way apply to um, items that are used by uh, the, um, if you look at on, uh, and, and this is a DE amendment, so on page one, line 21, it doesn't include at all um, items that are actually used by customers such as linens, paper napkins, and, and so forth. And there are definitions that are, that are set up um, uh, such as catering service, food service establishment, um, what it means to uh, furnish um, beverages, et cetera. Um, uh, prepared food has been um, a uh, uh, conundrum for Streamline for years, and um, it, is, uh, it is defined here by reference to um, that section of law that um, that uh, defines uh, prepared food, and that's in the sales tax. Um, 
that's in the sales tax um, section of, of the law. So this proposal is not a new one. We've had it any number of times trying to find a way to bring uh, uh, some uh, equivalent sales tax um, relief uh, to that of um, manufacturers in this particular um, industry segment. And um, the A2 amendment is what we have um, come up with. If you look at the, um, um, if you look at the um, revenue estimate, um, um, in my mind, it's a uh, surprisingly um, higher amount than I would have anticipated. Um, it's going to be running between seven and eight million uh, dollars um, a year, and um, and the assumptions on what would um, what would be covered are um, are there, and um, the. Uh, the difference in the amounts from year to year, particularly at the beginning, uh, is that the fiscal year 2024 estimates are adjusted for 11 months of uh, collection rather than um, rather than 12. We um, uh, uh, not exactly in closing on this, but you know we're we're going to be considering. Um, uh, getting rid of or repealing the um, accelerated June sales tax, and I'm thinking about that when the 11 months for uh, collections for this bill um, on um, on other products that we did not eliminate uh, previously when we got rid of the um, accelerated June tax payment, and so it's. The proposal that's there that we'll be looking at, I'm um, not sure we haven't already heard that, but that we'll be looking at is um, uh, tobacco, uh, uh, cigarettes, other tobacco products, and, um, and liquor, alcoholic beverages, uh, uh, not the ones sold in, um, in a bar or something. Um, uh, just to make a level playing field there with regard to the June accelerated. So um, that might play a part in, the, in this as well. Thank it's you, sir. pretty straightforward. Thank you, Senator Reston. We have two testifiers on the list. Could I call forward Ms. Amy Britton and Mr. Luke Durheim? Okay. Uh, and testifiers, in the interest of uh, getting this bill moved forward in our allotted time, I'm going to request that you try to limit your testimony to two minutes if possible. Um, Ms. Amy Britton, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members. My name is Amy Britton. I'm the operations manager for the D'Amico & Sons division of D'Amico Holding Company, which owns and operates 10 restaurants across the Twin Cities, some of which you might know support. We have uh, our two oldest, uh, Golden Valley and the Nicolette Mall, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 2124. It's not a secret. <clears throat> that our industry uh, was hard hit by the pandemic. Reopening and following best practices to protect staff and communities was difficult. Uh, just last week, I was listening to an NPR program um, that featured stories from a few of the locally owned family-run restaurants and bakeries that have closed during the pandemic. And although we were very heartened in this industry to find that Minnesotans were committed to supporting us through takeout orders and home deliveries and such, um, there's a lot of restaurants that didn't make it. Um, our D'Amico & Sons location on the U of M campus just reopened this past September. We were closed for two and a half years and it was a costly reopen. We walked through the kitchen and had to decide what pieces of equipment, uh, recharge it, repair it, repurpose it, or um, replace it. It was expensive. and. Uh, our Wyzetta location, after 25 years, closed its doors for good last spring. Part of the reason was the looming but necessary equipment purchases that we'd been putting off. Um, we just couldn't justify moving forward given the sales not returning. Um, so when you have equipment failure at the same time as revenue low, 
uh, loss, you have to make those kind of tough decisions. But uh, we have to do what's right for the guests first, and food safety is our number one priority. So just to give you a little perspective, the latest bid for kitchen equipment that I have seen was for a catering kitchen build last November. That total proposal was $242,000 just for the large equipment, no small wares, none of the little things. But the, the tax amount was $16,000. Um, the tax break of $16,000 up front would mean the difference between a big walk-in cooler and a small one, or maybe, um, importantly, a longer-lasting six-burner stove. So certainly an investment in the business. Um, and I look at that uh, at $16,000, that would mean a great deal to an aspiring Minnesota restaurateur that was looking to build out the next Minnesota neighborhood hotspot. So the bill before you today um, would give businesses like ours a window of relief. Um, we're still working to recover from the pandemic. Um, writing budgets for 2023, I've, I've been with D'Amico for 32 years, and I'm hopeful um, but we don't want to have to compromise restaurant equipment. We want to keep it in good working order and uh, deliver a quality product to our guests. Uh, with food and labor costs continuing to rise, that sales tax exemption on the purchase of restaurant equipment would help us retain that needed cash uh, and reinvest it in our businesses and our employees and ultimately our community. So today I'm asking for your support of Senate File 2124 uh, to exempt restaurant equipment from state and local taxes to help hospitality businesses like D'Amico and Sons continue to serve our guests and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Britton. Mr. Durheim, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Luke Durheim, one of the co-owners of Craft & Crew Hospitality that operates five restaurants and bars in the Twin Cities. Uh, some of you might know Stanley's in Northeast Minneapolis and the block in St. Louis Park. Uh, happy to be speaking with you today about the opportunity of this Senate file uh, 2124. Uh, over the past three years since the pandemic hit, our business model has rapidly changed like the other landscapes of other hospitality businesses in the, in the Twin Cities. We, pre-pandemic, were putting out about 5% of our to-go food in a box. And today, it's between 20 and 25% of our overall business. So it's just for our business and other restaurant owners we talked to, the business model has definitely changed as, as times have changed. Being that, uh, for us, it's really important looking at the whole totality of the operation as we view it as a, as a more of a manufacturing of actually food. And now with the traditional shift of a lot of the online delivery platforms that we've seen a rise of, is that that's really important um, that we feel like we are actually producing some really high quality manufactured goods with a really good hospitality experience. Uh, to, to do that, we need to continue to invest in more equipment. Just over the past two years, we've opened up a new restaurant um, and continually having to update our current equipment that does not have the longest shelf life. Uh, in the last two years, we've spent over $650,000 in uh, equipment um, that is just would be on this bill, um, and that's about a $50,000 sales tax uh, we've paid over the last two years just on at, at our operations. For that $50,000, what that would mean to us, if, if it was repealed, would be really having to look at more employee benefits, looking at to do more in the communities that we serve, hopefully hire more people to continue to grow and actually further generate more sales tax and more growth for the state of Minnesota. Today, the restaurants we've heard recently have actually in the state of Minnesota declined by about 10% since the pre-pandemic levels, and we just want to continue to make sure that Minnesota is a really great state to have not only a vibrant business community, but more of a vibrant restaurant community, which we all love and dear to go out on a regular basis. Hopefully, a lot of here people on the committee have feel the same way. So we really ask for you to support this bill to really put us on parity with other manufacturing facilities in the state and consider us uh, as well as a producing food um, for everyday Minnesotans. I encourage you to support Senate File 2124, and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Durheim, and thank you to both of the testifiers for keeping Minnesota an enjoyable place to live. Member comments or questions? Mr. Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe a question for staff. Um, the definition of catering service in the bill on 1.24 through 1.26, I'm not finding the reference there that we're trying to define, or maybe it's a fragment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Ms. Pollock. Maybe I'm. Maybe my tired eyes aren't seeing it, Ms. Pollock. 
Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Drzkowski, um, um, a, a business that prepares food and beverages for service in support of an event with a predetermined guest list, such as a reception, party, luncheon, conference, ceremony, or trade show. Um, it, I guess that that is a fragment of a sentence if that's what you're getting at, but um, I guess you, using our drafting conventions, this would be um, appropriate for purposes of the language here. Senator Disco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Pollack. I'm just not seeing, Ms. Pollack, where we have um, a need to define catering service in the bill. Ms. Pollack. Or the I'm, author. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Driskowski, uh, Driskowski, sorry for um, misunderstanding your question. Um, the, the term catering service, um, I believe, is used um, in the, um, it's cross-referenced in another term here, and I'm just trying to, to locate it. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could just have one minute, um, if, so I don't take Certainly. Maybe we can go to other committee members' questions or comments if there are any. Well, Ms. Pollack, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick comment. Uh, thank you so much uh, for moving this bill forward, uh, Senator Rest, and, and uh, improving upon it uh, with your uh, experience with uh, Streamlined and other areas. I really appreciate that, and I'm glad to see it uh, continuing forward this year. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Senator, Rust. Um, Ms. Pollack, um, the, the section, the reference section is 157.15, right? Um, uh, what a food service establishment includes. Um, and then it includes that, then on 128.29, the catering service that's defined in paragraph two. Right, I mean, so that's where it um, connects. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, Senator Draskowski, you may find that a fairly loose connection, but that's where, well, you know, that's, that's where the reference is made. We try to do that as often as, as we can um, to an already defined um, section of law that we can just include by reference. Ms. Pollack. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Rest, uh, thank you, and Senator Driskowski. Um, yes, just to, to follow up on uh, Senator Rest's comment, um, the, uh, the definition of, of food service establishment um, uses the term catering service, but um, most importantly, the exemption applies to food service equipment purchased uh, or leased by a food service establishment, which would include a catering service. So um, I think... That's what is the important reference here. Other member questions or comments? Close, Senator Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Pollack and Madam Chair, would we then want to call out catering service in the um, lines 1.5 through 1.8 to make that more clear? Just a question. Don't have to answer today, Madam Chair, but uh, that's all I have. Okay. Closing comments from the author. Um, no, sir, I'm finished. Uh, there are no further comments or questions. With that, Senate File 2124, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, there being no further business before this committee, we are adjourned. Thanks,